I remember a time when I made a phone call to Tom, he and I, years and years ago. Um, there was a time whenever in Austin, Texas, you could not tell the difference between Democrats and Republicans, much like today. And I, Tom, I believe Tom was the, uh, he was the party chair at that time. And I told him, I said, Tom, we got some people that won't be coming back next time. And I made good on that promise with the help of a lot of other people. And I'm going to tell you, we're in that day and time right now back in Austin, Texas. There's a lot of them. You can't tell the difference. Uh, but you can't tell the difference with Tom Palkin. So I'm asking you to give him your good attention. He's, gonna, he's been here before to speak. I'm going to ask you to turn off your cell phones and give him your good attention. And be sure you write Tom Palkin a really good question. Tom? Thank you, Joe. Man. It's uh, it's great to be back uh, and see some familiar faces, and uh, also meet have an opportunity to meet so many of you uh, today. First, I want to thank all of you uh, in this room and all the grassroots conservative leaders out there across our state and around the country. A lot of people uh, don't give you enough credit for what happened in 2010, but the reality is, but for the grassroots conservative movement. Uh, we would not have won control of the House of Representatives and, and prevented uh, the most liberal regime in American history from doing even more damage than it has already done and continues to try to do. And without that grassroots movement, which was really the strength of when I began as a Goldwater conservative, as a young Texan in Washington, D.C., in the Goldwater for President campaign, a part of the Reagan revolution, helping President Reagan and being part of that team, or as state chairman of the Republican Party when I got tired of a top-down party, of people mouthing the words conservatism, but in reality simply using and manipulating conservatives for their own purposes and felt that uh, we needed to take a minority party to a majority status and we need to do that by uniting conservative, social, and economic conservatives and building from the grassroots up, and we did that with, we did that with uh, 254 uh, county chairmen. We did that with a grassroots organization. And unfortunately, uh, we've drifted back into that same kind of top-down leadership, only now it's at the national level, even among our own, and unfortunately, in too many respects, uh, in the state government. And I say that in a way, uh, 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 reluctantly, because I was asked to go back into state government uh, in 2008. Uh, I didn't seek the position as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission. I guess I realized a little later maybe the governor had gotten in trouble for the inoculation of teenage girls in the Trans-Texas Corridor, which wasn't real popular with conservatives, so he, he uh, was going to change his tune or do something different. I went back in. I uh, have nothing personal against the governor or attorney general. I've been there for five years uh, as an outsider coming to Austin, and I left when I resigned in March of this year, well, ahead of the time my term was up. I left as an outsider of Austin. Uh, but I got very frustrated over some of the things that I saw down there and frustrated at the national leadership. We always seem to be on the defensive. We always seem to be allowing the other side to frame the debate. And I think I can be part of an effort again from the grassroots up to start putting the left on the defensive, beginning doing what we have done in the past by standing up for our conservative principles, by coming forward with common sense solutions which reach out to independents and discerning Democrats, what we used to call the Reagan Democrats, but people who in many ways are conservative and frustrated and don't like a top-down party, whether it's the Democrats or Republicans. But we've got to do something different. If we're going to take the fight to the left, we've got to do something here in the state of Texas, as Joanne mentioned, uh, that recent article in the Wall Street Journal, Texas Goes Sacramento. And I think back to a time when we were seriously talking about uh, reducing spending in government rather than significant, in fact, increases far beyond growth in population. But what I think is the central issue of our time is really <clears throat> the growing concentration of power in Washington, D.C. And how does Texas react to it? And I want to talk some specifics about uh, Texas and us reacting to it, but clearly uh, this is the most serious threat to our liberties we've ever seen. I wrote a book 
a number of years ago, I think it uh, came out around the time of the emergence of the grassroots conservative movement, whether it's the Patriot movement or the Tea Party movement, but grassroots conservatives around the country. And I said, you know, it's time to go back to our principles and build a party and a movement from the grassroots up. That's the only time we've ever been successful in advancing the cause against the left. You know, I'm a, I believe in pragmatism, but pragmatism to advance our principles, not pragmatism for the sake of getting a deal done, or compromising, or being able to get a nice publicity shot uh, for something that doesn't really advance our cause. But we have the most serious threat with this enormous concentration of power in Washington. And we've been very fortunate to live in, in the greatest state in the nation and grow up in the greatest nation in the world. But I'm involved in this, and I thought seriously about just going back to Port Aransas, where we now live and retiring. Uh, but I don't like what I see on the horizon. I think we can make a difference. I think we can turn this thing around. And I think we've got to begin here in Texas. Uh, we've been very fortunate to live in this great nation. But I'm frustrated by the career politicians on both sides of the aisle, and we've got them on our side in Washington and even in Austin. And they say all the right things, but they fail to frame the debate and take decisive action to halt and begin to reverse the leftist advances. It can be done, but it requires effective leadership and strong action, not just simply empty rhetoric. To borrow a phrase from my old boss, Ronald Reagan, speaking of the nation, status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. I even wrote a book about that as I, I talked about it, but the reality is we as conservatives can't just complain about what's going wrong. We've got to come up with common sense solutions based on our principles uh, to turn this thing around, and I'm confident that we can do that if we have the will and the right leadership and a team of people. That was always the strength of those of us in the conservative movement. We built a team of people who were in it for the right reasons, not for because they were big contributors want to influence things or crony capitalism or the kinds of things, uh, the bailout of the too big to fail financial institutions which took place in the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, but people that really are concerned about the country and I think back to Barry Goldwater and uh, when I was a young conservative and he had an expression, you know, we as conservatives there are there to represent the forgotten Americans, the middle class taxpayers and families who don't have lobbyists in Washington and aren't looking for loopholes in the law. Uh, our goal is not to represent big business, big labor, big government. They got plenty of folks taking care of their interests, but our interest is to be concerned about the people like us who are out there worried about the country and represent them. And I think that's been lost. I think even in Austin, there's too much of a top-down state government. Amen. And I came in, and uh, when I uh, came in as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission, I gotta say, I, I come in, been in business, been in the private sector, uh, wasn't paying close enough attention. I guess I'm like so many people that, you know, things are really bad in Washington, but they're great here in Texas, and they are good in many ways. I mean, just think last year we drilled 41% of, of, drill, of, of the wells drilled in America. Uh, we have a strong private sector growth. We have no state income tax. We've got a generally favorable regulatory climate. We've got a great entrepreneurial can-do spirit here in our state. There's so many things positive about Texas. And so I went down to Austin thinking everything's right. But I get down there, and, and one of the first things I saw, I was chairman of the Workforce Commission, quickly became a representative of the employers. I'm a small businessman myself, and as I went around the state and started talking to our Texas employers, I, I heard them say, you know, Tom, we've got some serious problems. Yeah, we've got great private sector job creation and all these good things from a tax and regulatory system, but where are the workers to fill our jobs? We've got a shortage of skilled workers, and we've got an educational system which has become too top-down, one-size-fits-all, which has neglected, almost denigrated, the value of vocational education. And what are we going to do about it? And in fact, the interesting thing, I, when I got back from Vietnam, I was an uh, oxymoron Army intelligence officer in Vietnam, <laughs> but when I came back and became a civilian again, I was appointed in 1970 to the National Advisory Council on Vocational Education, served on that council for five years. And back then, you know, there was a local control of education, something that's long disappeared. Secondly, there was a recognition, if you will, that uh, young people have different talents and interests. And you've got to have an educational system that recognizes that, and there was appreciation of the value of vocational education. And people could be career-ready or college-ready, 
but an understanding, if you will, that one size doesn't fit all. I came back into government, and again, I probably wasn't paying close enough attention, uh, involved in business and other things, and suddenly find out that we've got an elitist mindset that had taken over in Washington, and even in Austin. I call it the one-size-fits-all approach to education, where everybody's gonna go to a university, so we got this whole approach of pushing everybody to the university, which results, top-down system that neglected, almost uh, uh, completely ignored vocational education, and guess what, you got a shortage of skilled workers because vocational education courses were being phased out in our own state. And the irony is the architect of this system is a guy named Sandy Kress who's somehow been able to influence two Republican governors, first George Bush and now Rick Perry, uh, to buy into his approach, which was this top-down approach, which later led to the Bush-Kennedy No Child Left Behind bill, which is again federal control of education, state control of education, all these unfunded state and federal mandates, a top-down approach. And then after Sandy put all of this in place, he went out and uh, became a lobbyist for the British-owned company, Pearson, that has a $450 million contract, a testing contract here in the state of Texas. And he had the TOS test and the TOS test and the STAR test. And meanwhile, we're going begging in terms of kids who are dropping out of school because they don't have an opportunity for vocational and technical education. So I began to work with some people in Austin, <clears throat> and I thought initially that I'd have support from the governor's office. We didn't. I'm glad he signed a bill that just recently passed, but it was only reluctantly. Uh, but Dan Patrick and Jimmy Don Acock uh, pushed forward, and it recognizes, if you will, that we need to have multiple pathways to a high school degree. Everybody should get the basics, but also what do we do with these young people who, the 60% who aren't gonna go on to a four-year university or dropping out of our schools, that we're losing. And I believe as a conservative in a philosophy of a hand up, not a hand out, and there's an old Chinese proverb, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. And yet here we are with a whole bunch of kids dropping out of school because they aren't given an opportunity for vocational and technical education because the courses aren't there. And as a result, they wind up being dropouts or throwaways and go into minimum gangs or minimum wage jobs when otherwise they could have, with a coherent sequence of vocational courses, get a industry-wide certificate, industry-recognized certificate or a license by the time they came out of high school. So fortunately, people began to work together and put a coalition. And I think we've made real headway in recognizing, if you will, Let's move back towards local control of education, multiple pathways to a high school degree, and greater emphasis on opportunities for those students who have the talent and interest on vocational and technical education. Realize the average age of a plumber is 56, of a welder 55, of a stonemasonry craftsman 69, and the wages out there in these fields are excellent. You know, a plumber can make $75,000 in three years. A welder coming out of the craft training center in Corpus Christi uh, can make uh, uh, $1,700 a week in the Eagle for Shade. A young person coming out of Texas State Technical College with a two-year technical degree, engineering related technology and instrumentation, starts in the petrochemical industry at $68,000 a year. So the point is that good sound policies of people working together can make a difference, and we did it there, but there are other issues that gotta be addressed. I mean, I, as some of you may have been involved in the old fight that I led when Ann Richards tried to give us this Robin Hood school finance scheme, taking property taxes, local school property taxes, this is in 1993, uh, from some districts and transferring it to others with the state as the redistribution agent. I call it uh, a French revolutionary approach. The only way to bring some people up is to take other people down and take local property taxes and ship them elsewhere. Well, we defeated it when she tried to put it in with a constitutional amendment by two to one. She put it in legislatively, and guess what? Two governors later, it's still there, and we're doing nothing about it. We're bogged down in the courts. The governor and attorney general defend it, and in my judgment, it's unconstitutional because it's a violation of our state constitutional prohibition against the statewide property tax, which is what it is, and we're taking 374 districts' money, their local property taxes, from their districts in an amount of $1.1 billion in shipping them elsewhere. Well, the time is there for Robin Hood to go, and Governor, I'll put a coalition together, get rid of it once and for all, and replace 
that $1.1 billion of double property taxes for many people who unfortunately may live in a so-called property-rich district, who are double taxed, have a higher property taxes, replace it with a fairer and more equitable system of funding public education. But it's like government is on autopilot down there, and well, that's a tough issue. So it's easier to sort of say the right things about Obama and be critical there, but it's much harder to get in and do things to advance our conservative principles. I'm one who believes that local property taxes should stay local and not be transferred elsewhere. <laughs> now, you know, Joanne raised a very good point, the Wall Street Journal people, the piece, Texas Go Sacramento. And I mean, there's some people out there that just say, well, you know, you just can't control the growth of spending time. And there's this idea, well, more revenue, so let's spend it all. But the reality is, you know, I, I, I think back, people tell me, oh, there's just no way you can do it. Well, I headed a federal agency in the Reagan administration. It's called Action. Um, we cut the budget by 25% the bureaucracy in half. Uh, we did, our model was doing more with less. Uh, and we established initiatives like the Vietnam Veteran Leadership Program to help recognize the service of our, our fellow Vietnam veterans and help get people jobs or deal with problems associated with the Vietnam experience. And the Just Say No to Drugs Program, which Mrs. Reagan was the chief spokesman for. All of this, and yet we cut the budget. But we used, if you will, a conservative approach towards getting things done. And it's like down in Austin, it's on autopilot. And there isn't this kind of sound policy thinking of coming up with ideas, how do we do things better? You know, I kind of expected going down there like what we did in the Reagan administration. I don't want to look backwards, but the model of, it's a simple model. You know, the people in the cabinet met regularly and kind of worked together to advance the cause. We did that in the sub-agencies. We're always trying to look for getting talented, knowledgeable people out there. How can we do things better? Uh, I'm down in Austin and uh, chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission, which is equivalent to the head of the U.S. Department of Labor. But there are all these other people that are agency appointees. You think we're going to get together on a regular basis? We met one time when I was there. It was the time of the Great Recession of 2008. And we were all called together uh, for a meeting in a room. And it was like a five, the governor came in and the press was all there, took a photo. We're dealing with these serious issues. And then as soon as the press left the room, the governor walked out of the room. And I thought to myself, you know, we're really serious about developing sound policies and there's so many areas that are critical. I mean, the property tax issue. I, led, I was asked to chair the appraisal reform task force. We had some great ideas. We had a hearings here in, in Tyler and Ashton was there loaded with people with some great ideas around the state. We had a good report. No leadership pushing it through to deal with this property tax issue and, and, and the burden of people in their homes. I mean, you know, you pay off your mortgage, but you got a perpetual lien on your property. I mean, we've got to address some of these issues and figure out how do we, how do we approach this in a substantive way? And yet there is no leadership in terms of dealing with important issues out there. Take transportation. I don't know Joanne has talked about that and worked on that. You know, we once had the best pay-as-you-go system of transportation uh, here in, in, in the I mean, in the country, a wonderful system in the old days. Now, you know, I'm dating myself again, but I remember as a young man, uh, you know, we had a road <clears throat> from uh, Fort Worth, Dallas to Fort Worth. It was a toll road. But guess what? When the toll road was paid off, it became a free road. Yeah. Now we got all the free roads being turned into toll roads. And we're subsidizing with our taxes, with our gas tax. And we have a situation in which the money is being diverted that ought to go for road construction, maintenance, repairs, and it's siphoned elsewhere. Oh, well, they need that money for other things, so don't dare use it for its intended purpose, which is road. And in the meanwhile, they say, oh, well, we're not raising taxes, but we have the highest debt burden of any state in the nation, $13 billion in principal. And 30 million, uh, 30 billion, 13 billion in principle, and 30 billion when you add the interest that we're obligated for. And yet the governor, the other day, came out for a hundred-year bond. You know, uh, generations yet to come will have to pay that off. And then he, then he said something about, well, we can, we can take that money and invest it in the stock market. Well, clearly, someone who's not been in the private sector 
And I've been a venture capital executive, and it's a, it's a risky business getting into the investment world. There are no guaranteed sure things, as you in this room and anybody who's been in it knows. But the idea of piling more debt and more toll roads on is the, is the wrong direction. I reverse that as governor, move back in the direction of more free roads, fewer toll roads, and a pay-as-you-go transportation system here in the state of Texas for the state. And I, I guess the thing that's frustrated me is, is uh, my view is that decisions ought to be made. It doesn't mean you're right all the time. And we're going to always, there are going to be areas of disagreement among us in this room, areas of disagreement uh, if I'm elected governor over individual decisions uh, that are made. And, and they're always hard calls, but you've got to be willing to make hard decisions. You've got to be able to be willing to bring people together and try to come up with what you think is the best for the state of Texas and the best for this country. One of the things that's disturbed me down there, and it's, and it's, in, it's in Washington as well, the power of the big money. I mean, with all due respect, uh, you know, I, I can't believe that the Attorney General has given, you know, has raised $18 million because they love him, or the governor raises a ton of money because they love him. The reality is the power of big money is so enormous these days in politics, in Texas, and in na at the national level. And what happens is there's, there's this tendency, if you will, for decisions to be influenced by the power of the Austin insiders and the lobbyists. And they're entitled to make their point, to make their argument. But good governance is making decisions based upon what's for the good of the state and for the good of the nation. And that's missing. And if we don't wake up to that, we're going to suddenly wake up five years from now and have a nasty surprise even in our state. We got too much of what I call crony capitalism. As I said, <laughs> you know, I, I've been in the venture capital business, and it's tough enough to make it work. But we shouldn't be using our tax dollars, other people's money, to fund public venture capital investments. I don't care whether Obama does it, and he's done it, picking winners and losers, and generally losers, yeah. or this administration, the Perry administration doing it, picking winners and losers with a public venture capital fund. That should have been ended this last time. And to his credit, Senator Altife tried to do something about it. Unfortunately, the governor and his people got it funded again to the tune of $50 million. On day one, I will end that fund and use that $50 million to improve our border security and address the problem of the drug cartels in our state. And we've got to get away from this whole business of, 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 of crony capitalism. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's just simply the influence and the power of too many insiders. Finally, I think that we've got to understand, and I'm a believer, I've always been a believer in term limits. I've tried to limit my service at different times, and, and I will, as governor, uh, commit to term limits. Two terms is enough, but not just commit personally. We need to have two four-year terms for our statewide elected officials. That needs to be passed. They simply stay too long. I know these guys have got nothing personal against them, but I knew, I knew them back in the 1990s when I was state party chairman. And today, sometimes down in Austin, I hardly recognize them. It's sort of a disconnect from them and the rest of us. And we can't continue to have that because they, they, maybe it's on autopilot, maybe because they've been doing certain things a certain way, but they begin to lose touch with what's, what people are worried about and concerned about out there, and it becomes more about them than about moving us in the right direction. And you know what? The reality is if, if, if everything is great for the next four years, here in Texas and in our nation, you don't need Tom Pocket. I mean, you know, it can be on autopilot. The bureaucracy's really running the train down in, in Austin. And, and, and Joanne's figures, I looked at those figures. I was taken aback uh, at the increases in salaries for the people who are running, uh, running state government, the bureaucrats. I mean, they work to take care of themselves. In fact, I remember I got uh, my commissioner, I was chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission. 
until I, I, uh, I'm the only statewide who did not endorse uh, Rick Perry for president. I didn't endorse anybody else, but I stayed out of it. But, but after, uh, but later the, um, they decided to have somebody else chairman for the period of time uh, that I was going to be there. I said, that's fine. Uh, but it was interesting. The first, one of the first things the new chairman did, because I'd resisted increasing the salary of our top official the entire time I was there, the first thing he did was come in to raise the salary of the individual who was running the agency. He'd been there a long time. But I just didn't think it was appropriate in this economic climate. And so he was very upset. He wanted a unanimous vote, sort of like that group in the Senate. They wanted a unanimous vote. Everybody then is in it together. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I voted against it. I voted against an increase. And then you turn around and you see stuff like this going on. And it sends the wrong signal. It sends the wrong signal to the people working in the agencies. It sends a wrong signal to the Texas public and the taxpayers. But, oh, we got a lot of money, so we can really increase our salaries. you got to have, if you will, a business plan. And you need to bring a group of outsiders into Austin, like what we did when we went to Washington. And one of the things, again, I, I, I don't want to look back, but the models, there's some interesting things that you can do. We put together a grace commission in the Reagan administration to identify what are essential services and non-essential services. Break it down that way. Where can we identify savings and efficiency? And we brought a whole group of people outside business and civic leaders in to take a look at it. They had some recommendations for our agency. I followed them, and we got a lot of savings. Some agencies and departments didn't. But we need something similar, a nonpartisan commission of outsiders to come in in the transition as soon as the governor's election's over in November and identify, if you will, what are essential services, what are non-essential services, where can we find savings and efficiencies, and how we get people working together to do more with less and to be more productive. We can do that, and we need to do it. But it's missing again, and there's so much talent out in the state that could be utilized, but there is this tendency for sort of cronies and Austin insiders to run things and promote their own. And that, that mindset has to change if we're going to move into the future because, again, maybe things are going to be okay, but I don't believe you can do what Greenspan did first and Bernanke is doing now, uh, keeping interest rates artificially low. I warned about it in my book. I wrote about it long before the book came out uh, that uh, the bubble is going to burst on the subprime mortgage. I call it passing the trash approach to Wall Street financing. And we know, in my estimation, the next bubble to burst is the government debt bubble. We've seen it in Cyprus. We've seen it in Europe. It's going to head our way. But what do we do in Texas? If, if chaos breaks loose, if our currency loses value, what if we do if there's a, a disruption? How do we protect ourselves? And we've got to be responsible fiscally, but we also have the right kind of leadership to be proactive rather than just simply reactive. You know, all this stuff about the voting rights things. Well, where were Greg Abbott and Rick Perry in 2005? We had a Republican president, George W. Bush, a Republican-controlled Senate and Republican Congress. Why didn't they go up and say, we don't need Texas to be singled out with a few other states and jurisdictions and put under the Department of Justice bureaucracy for another 25 years in the Voting Rights Act? It would seem to me that's a pretty simple thing to get done. And yet it wasn't done. We're mired down with millions of dollars in a lawsuit. And unfortunately, because I think the case was badly mishandled in San Antonio, we're going to wind up potentially losing a number of legislative seats and maybe even one or two congressional seats unless the Supreme Court throws the entire statute out or Section 5 of the statute out. But why didn't we get that done at the right time? Why didn't we get a waiver on Medicaid so we could do things our own way in Texas like Rhode Island, a democratic state, got in the Bush administration. That's kind of failing to be proactive in thinking ahead. And finally, I would simply say <clears throat> that no matter what we do to deal with the, the serious problems we face, one of the things that we've got to be concerned about what's happening to the culture. We've got termites eating away at the foundations of our freedoms, of our free market system, or our traditional American of values. This administration has been the most aggressive liberal regime in history in pushing its social agenda, using every kind of power, whether the military or others, to do that. And we cannot ignore the cultural issues. I have a chapter in my book called The Coarsening of the Culture, and the first words are 
at the top, in the name of God, amen. That was what the people who came over to this nation, the Mayflower Compact, wrote. And then there's a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Men Have Forgotten God, one of my great heroes from the 20th century, a prophetic voice in Russia. But here's what he said. He said, you know, when I was a young boy and the Leninists and communists had taken over, I asked the village elders, why did all of this happen? And they told me it was because men have forgotten God. And he went through the gulag, wrote these marvelous critiques and novels about what life was truly like under communism and paid a heavy price, but he studied the history of the rise of communism in his nation. And he said, 50 years later, I came to the conclusion there was no better explanation for what had happened to my nation than that men have forgotten God. But then he came to the US and he came to London and he said, you two are making that mistake and you're gonna pay a very heavy price. We ignore God, we ignore the roots, underlying principles of Christianity, underlying our, our society at our peril. And we have to do everything in our power to preserve those values. In closing, if I can, and, and, and I do want to, before reading this quote, ask you to consider helping me. Um, it needs grassroots support. We need your help. We're at TomTalkingForTexas.com. We've got literature. We've got sheets here. But I have a chapter in my book called A Return to Constitutional Principles. And I may sound Pollyannish, but I think that, uh, I think we can turn this thing around. I think the movement is out there. The people are ahead of the career politicians and sensing the seriousness of the moment. But here is what was written in a book that kind of got me involved in the conservative movement in the first place, Conscience of a Conservative in 1960. The time will come when we entrust the conduct of our affairs to the men who understand that their first duty as public officials is to divest themselves of the power they've been given. It will come when Americans in hundreds of communities throughout the nation decide to put the men in office who are pledged to enforce the Constitution and restore the Republic. Wow, isn't that relevant today even more so than back then? Thank you very much. Try to, I'll try to repeat the question if you want me to. When are we going to end property taxes? When are we going to end property taxes? Uh, I think the first step is to um, end Robin Hood. That's $1.1 billion. We can get that done, in my estimation, uh, the first session of the legislature uh, after I'm elected governor. And I'm, I'm serious about it because I think the time is right uh, to do that. You have a lot of formerly property poor districts, some in South Texas, where energy has been discovered and oil has been discovered, and guess what? They were property poor districts before, now they're property rich districts, and all of a sudden their mindset has changed. So there's a real opportunity to put a coalition together to get rid of this unconstitutional Robin Hood tax scheme and get rid of it uh, uh, for good, and that will be the first step. And then I think you've got to get people like Cecil Bell Jr. Uh, and others who are very interested in, in moving us away from, from property taxes. You've got to figure out, you know, what's the alternative. But I think that property taxes are essentially unfair. I've seen, you know, what happened to my dad and other people, uh, seniors who happen to live in an area. I mean, just an example, the $20,000 house suddenly in a mega ma mansion neighborhood, and the taxes, even with the senior exemptions, go up. You literally force people out of their houses or their children out, you know, and uh, if they pass on. This is just, uh, this is not a fair system, and, and we've got to figure out some alternatives. I've been in this fight a long time. I will do what I can. I don't want to promise everything overnight, but I, I, the first step is Robin Hood. The second step is figuring out a strategy to have less reliance on property taxes and alternative funding mechanisms. How do you think Texas is going to manage working with Obamacare? <clears throat> Uh, well, it's going to be, it's a train wreck. 
uh, there's no way to work with it. Uh, I wish what we had done, uh, the Supreme Court was silent in its um, opinion, uh, and unfortunately John Roberts uh, went the wrong way on that, on that decision, but it was silent on the issue of whether the Obama administration, the federal government, could force us in Texas, and I'm talking about Medicaid here, not Medicare, it has nothing to do with Medicare, but Medicaid, uh, which needs to be block granted, I've advocated that in my book for years, uh, and we should have gotten one. I wish if we'd gotten one when Bush was president, we wouldn't be even addressing this issue because we could do what we want to do with the funding. But I would have liked to have seen the legislature draw up uh, legislation which essentially says, uh, we'll take the money, but we'll take it with no strings attached. And um, then they're going to say, well, you can't do that. And then immediately go into U.S. District Court, Federal District Court in Austin and challenge them on Tenth Amendment uh, grounds and in light of the Supreme Court decision, which was silent on that issue. And again, I think you've got to, you've got to be proactive on some of these things and push back at them. So that's what I would, I would favor to do. But this thing is, is broken, what it's going to do to employers, what it's going to do to job creation. I mean, I talk to employers that are hire, have 45 employers, they want, uh, employees, they want to hire more people, but they're not going to hire more people uh, because they're worried they're going to get over the 50 threshold. And you've got, a, you've got other people that are, that are in business that um, are taking people from full-time to part-time because of Obamacare. It's terrible. It's terrible for the workers. It's terrible for the employers. It's terrible for the taxpayers. I just saw something the other day. Ohio's health care costs are going way up as a result of Obamacare. I'd love to see the figures here in Texas. I haven't seen them. They're going to go up. Uh, this, is a, this is a bloody disaster. And I think that, again, uh, it's going to be a train wreck, but we need to put together a common sense conservative alternative uh, uh, to Obamacare and would work with our, our congressmen and, and senators on that. This is a three-part question. Okay. Have you officially announced your run for governor? What are you doing to run a viable campaign? And then will you speak to the Republicans' women group on September 19th? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes to number three. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, it's going to be it, it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm yes, I am in this race, and, and, and I'm not. Uh, no matter whether Rick and Greg both get in it, nothing personal against them. But I've been down there for five years, and I just uh, I, I, I I'm not comfortable that uh, uh, the leadership or the approach is going to change whichever one, if one of the two uh, got elected. Number two. Uh, we are organizing, we're uh, raising money. I put my own money in, I call it venture capital money. Um, if I lose, I don't get it back. Uh, but I think it's important enough, uh, and I'm not doing this uh, as a lark or just to make a point. If I didn't think there's a pathway to victory, which I'm confident is here. Uh, fortunately, we just have, in fact, Josh is here. Josh Jones has just come on as our campaign uh, manager. Uh, Josh was, uh, uh, regional political director in the Ted Cruz campaign uh, for governor out of Harris County, I mean for senator out of uh, Harris County, and I think we're putting together a very effective grassroots network. We need a team of people. We need a lot of the young people involved. He's helping us bring many of the young people aboard. Nathan Durr of the SREC has just come aboard as our operations director. So I think we're putting a good team together, but I don't underestimate uh, the, uh, the difficulty of this, and we're going to need your help in the grassroots. It's, uh, we're, we've got to raise enough money to have the chips in the game, so to speak, uh, but if we have the grassroots effort, uh, we can do what I did with the help of so many grassroots conservatives in 1994. We were heavily outspent when I ran for party chairman. We defeated the incumbent, and they had a congressman get in after he dropped out, and we defeated him, and then more importantly, I did what I said I, was, I, I would do uh, after I was elected uh, a state chairman. And I will do what I say I will do after I'm elected a governor, and I will not suddenly turn away from the grassroots uh, and ignore the grassroots, but the grassroots are gonna be involved heavily in our administration. They have to be. There's so much talent and knowledge out there and an understanding and commitment uh, to this state, and there's just too much this insider mentality in Austin. Nullification of unconstitutional laws passed by Congress by standing up to the feds, including the Supreme Court. Well, you have you have 
three or four aspects to that. Let's take a specific issue. Let's take the Second Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, it's clear the Second Amendment's not about guns. It's about the threat of an overreaching government um, that um, uh, is um, winds up, uh, if you will, uh, taking the guns away from uh, the uh, that, that takes guns away from the citizens. We saw what happened with Nazi Germany, Soviet Union, Castro's Cuba. Uh, if the federal government were in violation of the Second Amendment and came in and tried to impose uh, laws or rules or regulations in violation of the uh, Second Amendment, then we in Texas have to stand up against that. I also believe that there are cases out there in which, uh, and we've seen it with the recent disclosure about the targeting of conservative groups and Tea Party activists, one lady in Houston who not only was targeted uh, on, by the IRS, but by OSHA, by all of these other agencies and departments. So how do we think proactively here in Texas? Uh, we've got to have a strong effort to push back as a state but what about our citizens? What about somebody that, you know, uh, an oppressive bureaucrat using the Endangered Species Act or using the uh, OSHA or EPA uh, to really put somebody who's a legitimate small businessman or woman out of business or target an individual inappropriately? They don't have the money or the resources to stand up. So why not an ombudsman or an advocate here in the state of Texas? And you've got to carefully and you got to pick the right cases and make sure you're prudent in picking cases. But I think the state ought to be willing to stand up for people. If you think of the Tenth Amendment, it's powers that are not granted to the federal government or reserved to the states and the people respectively. And we as a state have a right and responsibility to stand up for our people as well. Would you propose a constitutional amendment that would allow the state to have recall elections for politicians who are not doing their jobs from state-wide offices to the state senators and representatives? Um, I, you know, I had, I had not thought that through. Um, I did support term limits for, for statewide officials. I'd be open to consideration of it. I just want to think that through more carefully. I know you've got local recalls, so I don't see why that wouldn't uh, be an option to consider. But I, had, I, I need to think more about it. I, I, haven't, uh, I, I haven't thought that one through. If the federal government can't or won't secure the border, can Texas secure it on its own, and how, and what are you going to do to secure it? Right. Well, let me say firsthand, uh, first of all, I have no confidence that Janet Napolitano and Homeland Security are going to protect our Texas border. So you begin with that principle. And, uh, and, and then you, um, uh, as I said, I take $50 million and say, well, where's the money going to come from to increase technology to control our border? And there are apparently some, and I, I, I you know, you need to have the right people involved who are knowledgeable. There are some technological advances that, in a rather modest way, sure really could, could help us in a major way protect our own border. So I'd bring the top civilian and or uh, military uh, people you can find to take a look at how better to secure our border uh, from a technological standpoint or other standpoints. Secondly, uh, you've got to bring in a very sophisticated uh, group of people in a, in a, uh, with an intelligence background. And I joke a little bit about my background, but, have, but it is important to have people who have knowledge and experience how to deal with these drug cartels that are there, how to identify, how to, how to uh, address what we can do about them and, and lessen their influence and, and roll them up, if you will. Uh, but I would, I would operate under the assumption that we've got to uh, handle these matters ourselves. If Homeland Security helps us, that's fine, uh, but it's up to us primarily to take care of, of, of our own board. Are you fearful or confident of the Hispanic vote? Oh, I'm actually, um, I'm confident we can turn that around. I, I can say in 1980, if we go about it in the right way, everybody's caught up on this immigration. They say, oh, we've got to pass this to win the Hispanic vote. Uh, give me a break. I mean, they're there are plenty of uh, Mexican-American, uh, I mean, my wife is Hispanic, who are not for amnesty. There are plenty of people who, 
who are uh, who share our values. I mean, we can win 40% or more of the Hispanic community. I'll tell you how. I, I dealt with it in 1984 working for President Reagan when I was dispatched down to the Rio Grande Valley and an Alinsky, Saul Alinsky style group called Valley Interfaith was trying to take over the valley. And I worked with local elected officials, most of whom were Democrats, uh, moderate to conservative Democrats, but they were pro-life, pro-family. Uh, strong patriotic sentiment, a strong work ethic, a commitment to education, neighbor helping neighbor. And they didn't like this leftist group trying to impose their ideology on the valley. Well, I worked with them. We put the left on the defensive, and Ronald Reagan carried the Rio Grande Valley. Now, you got a group out of uh, San Antonio, and that's what bothers me. With all due respect to Greg Abbott and Rick Perry, they don't have a clue about what the left is up to and what these guys are doing and how they're going about it and how to put them on the defense. You got Ernesto Cortez, who was the guy who orchestrated the Valley Takeover in 1984 that we undid and we defeated. He's down involved, he's in his 70s now, but he's, the, he's one of the Alinsky organizers. He was a regional guy, Chicago was the hub where Barack Obama was trained. San Antonio is one of the, one of the regions and Ernesto Cortez is, uh, was involved in that, and he's working on the five-year plan to take over the state. you got the Castro brothers down there who are, uh, you know, they're not for, fa pro, they're, they're the opposite, they're anti-family, they're anti-life. And guess what? There are a bunch of Tejano Democrats in there, they're anti-military, uh, anti who we can woo over with the right approach, but we've got we've to identify warriors on our side in the Hispanic community that believe in our conservative principles, and there are plenty out there, but not just getting up and, quote, Hispanic outreach, or we've got to do what, we've got to vote for this bill in the Senate. You know, amnesty didn't work in 1986. It's not going to work now. And this is, this is a, you know, we're, we're getting trapped on letting them frame the debate. Let's go after them. This vocational education issue I've been pushing, you know, uh, it's enormously pos pos uh, popular in the Hispanic community because we're saving a lot of kids who otherwise would have been dropouts. And so there are many, many issues that, that relate and resonate, re relate to and resonate with the Hispanic community. But look, we're all, we come from different backgrounds, but we're first Americans, okay? And let's not forget it. And we've got, I put together Texas Veterans Leadership Program run by returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan to help their fellow veterans. We've helped over 11,000. We're going to sunset the program. But in that, in that initiative, we've got quite a few Hispanic leaders who are involved. And guess what? They're conservative. And they're patriotic. And let's just identify them and work with them and bring them in as part of that grassroots team of ours. George Rodriguez, the Tea Party leader in San Antonio, standing up to the Castro's. Great, you know, he's a conservative fighter. You don't got to support people like that that are in the, in the trenches, if you will. What are the possible alternatives for revenue to property taxes? Well, I th on, on the um, Robin Hood school finance scheme, you, I think your, your best bet in terms of an approach would be to take $1.1 billion, either expand the sales tax or slightly higher sales tax to replace the entire portion of the Robin Hood transfer from some districts to others. So that's, uh, that I think is probably the best alternative. I'm not in favor under any circumstances of a state income tax replacing property taxes. Uh, but, and, and once you get started with a state income tax, it never goes away, <laughs> if we all know. So uh, I think uh, the 1.1 billion, you get it from an expanded sales tax base or slightly higher sales tax. Well, you know, we had that issue um, <clears throat> when I was a kid. Uh, I was a Democrat back then. Alan Shivers was the governor. And uh, he uh, had the Tidelands fight with the Truman administration where they were trying to take our offshore uh, property uh, because energy, you know, the oil had been discovered there. And he fought the Tidelands controversy uh, to protect our Texas uh, land rights and ultimately prevailed. So you have to look at things on an individual basis, but there's a good example of a governor who stood up for Texas against the federal government and won.